Uh, thanks very much, and thanks very much to Joe for the invitation to, to speak here today. Uh, I'm going to say nothing about the, the film that was shown. Uh, we might come back to it maybe in the, the, the Q&A session after. Like the, the title of the, the session here is Inequality. Is there an answer? Like the first thing I should have asked is, well, what's the question? Like, what are we addressing? When you look at inequality, you can describe it in different ways. Do we mean, as can be termed, like inequality or equality of opportunity? Or do we mean equality or inequality of outcome? Well, from being an economist, I'd focus a lot on things like opportunity cost and other issues like that, which can be quite difficult to me measure. When we look at inequality, we tend to look at things that can get measured in the parlance of management, like what gets measured gets managed. And we can measure inequality of outcome. And that's maybe where a lot of the debate goes. What are the actual outcomes in terms of income and in terms of wealth? What are the inequalities there? Because we can go and measure them. But, as David suggested, there are different things you can measure. If you're looking at income inequality, do you measure earned income? What people are going out and getting in the marketplace? David showed a chart there of the differences in earned income in Ireland over the last 30, 40 years. The proportions going to the, the, those at the top and how that has been increasing. But that's only one measure of what's earned or, or of income. Equally, then, you have disposable income. What we get to spend, what's left after taxes and transfers. And economies have been changing and evolving. David spoke about like the, the Keynesian revolution, maybe the 1930s, that worked through right up to the 60s and 70s. And then the change that happened maybe when the likes of Reagan and Thatcher came to power in the 1980s. <clears throat> but the, the government sector of Keynes' time in the 1930s is very different to the government sector of the 1980s. Like when John Maynard Keynes was writing about uh, how e economies can be managed from a macroeconomic perspective, the government sector, in equivalent terms, was less than 20% of GDP. In Ireland, we're still relatively low, but we're up now to about 40% in terms of government expenditure, and most EU countries are around 50%. So the impact of the government sector has increased. So it's very hard to disentangle effects and say, well, what caused one thing to go up or one thing to go down? So when it comes to earned income and disposable income, we have differences there. Equally then, when it comes to wealth inequality, the CSO recently have done some work on wealth inequality in Ireland, and it has been quite insightful to see that wealth inequality is there. But actually, the economy needs wealth inequality. There should be wealth inequality. Somebody who's 65 should have more wealth than somebody who's 25, because the person who's 65 should be near retirement. They should have something that will sustain them for hopefully the next 15, 20, 25 years. But of course, what's key then is what income did they have for the 40 years previously? So I think wealth inequality is important, but it can get an overemphasis. <clears throat> Particularly when a lot of people mention the film there in terms of their wealth, it tended to be those who own businesses, like so those who own Walmart or those who own Apple. <clears throat> That's wealth, but it's not really money that they can spend. Like during the week, Apple announced results. Um, they seem to be pretty good results. They announced profits of $12 billion for a quarter in terms of their income, but their share, their market capitalization fell by 66 billion. The people who owned Apple shares lost 66 billion in value. Now, we won't be shedding any tears for them, but in terms of the share price itself, that's not really going to make much of an impact on their lives. The company itself made a massive profit. And we have issues in how wealth is measured. If I was to fill out one of that, those surveys, I list up my assets, list up my liabilities, and they could work out my net worth but it would leave out my most important asset. Okay, you would say my health, my family, etc. But from a financial perspective, my most important asset is something that won't appear on those balance sheets the CSO will measure. Because my most important asset is accrued. I'm a public servant. When I get to 68, as it is now, <laughs> I will have benefits of a public sector pension. But I don't have a statement that says what it is. It's an accrued asset for me. Equally, for lots of individuals in Ireland, maybe their most important asset are their PRSI contributions. Hopefully, once we can manage to sustain the system, that will provide an income for them once they reach 65. But again, that won't be recorded. So we have these issues with income and wealth. Equally, we issues with what are we measuring? What is the question? If we look at just at an Irish perspective, when it comes to disposable income spending, Ireland isn't unusually unequal. As David suggested, we're somewhere towards the middle usually a thing called the Gini coefficient. If everything is distributed equally, the Gini coefficient measures uh, the difference between perfect equality and actuality. 
And if everything is distributed equally, the Gini coefficient is zero. There is no difference between equality and what we have. If there's perfect inequality, if one person has everything, the Gini coefficient is one. So it gives us a range. Uh, and Ireland's Gini coefficient is about 0.3. Now, in the numbers, David said it said it was 30. For some reason, people like multiplying things by 100. So the Gini coefficient is 30. But technically, in how it's measured, it's an area, so it can't be greater than 1. It's 0.3. So Ireland isn't uh, unusually unequal when it comes to disposable income. And we know from studies now the benefits of reducing disposable income inequality. Countries, particularly richer and developed countries, that reduce their disposable income inequality perform better. They have greater economic growth, greater income, there's greater benefits. <coughs> but one key issue that, that those OECD studies um, address is what's happened to income inequality in countries. And these studies looked at income inequality from the 1980s up to the present day. And there was only three countries in the study, there's 30 countries in the study, there's only three countries in the study that showed an actual decline in disposable income inequality, where things had improved. They looked at the impact of inequality on growth, but if you actually looked at the data, you could see, well, what happened to inequality itself? Let's strip out the growth effect and just see, well, what happened to inequality? So only three countries showed a reduction in disposable income inequality. Ireland was one of the three. Disposable income inequality in Ireland now is lower than it was in the 1980s. And only three OECD countries exhibit that. Our Gini coefficient back then was about 0.35. It's now down to about 0.3. <clears throat> For poorer countries, it's likely that they would benefit from more income inequality. <clears throat> Brazil, India, China, Russia, etc. Income inequality in those countries is increasing. So we do get a bit of a difference. For poorer countries, when everybody's at the bottom, we'd like to lift at least some people up. But for in richer countries where you have lots of people at the top, there are benefits from bringing those up at the bottom. But how then is Ireland unique? If on this disposable income measure, we're towards the middle, and we're one of the few countries where the inequality is actually even reducing, as David suggested, we're unique when it comes to earned income. We have the most unequal distribution of earned income in the developed world. Stand out right at the very top, the most unequal. <clears throat> so just to take that a step further, I'll say, well, why is that? Why is our Gini coefficient for earned income 0 0.55, 0 0.56, right up towards the top? Well, we can bar look, boil it down to three reasons. <coughs> Borrowing from some previous work has looked at this. One is the presence of large multinationals in Ireland, an oversized presence in the multinational sector, particularly U.S. multinationals. U.S. multinationals directly employ about 100,000 people. The average personnel cost in those companies is €60,000. So they're high-paying sectors with about 100,000 people. If you take the domestic sector and look at Irish companies, the average personnel cost is just over 30,000. So we have inequality there because we have a certain group of people who are up towards the top, who are dragging up in terms of the portion that they get. Equally, if you look down towards the bottom, we too tend to have a large cohort at the bottom who are not getting a lot. One is down to the structure of our economy. We have lots of farmers, and this looks at market income. Most farmers have very little market income. In large part, their income is dependent on a subsidy. Now, that supports their income, but when they fill out these um, surveys to look at what their income is, they get a transfer, and then you say, well, how much did you earn from actual farming activity? Right down towards the bottom. It's the, the transfers sustaining them. And equally in Ireland, we have an unusually large uh, uh, proportion of the population who live in what are called jobless households. Households, essentially, where there's no market income going in. So there are some disputes about how this is measured, but just looking at what's called the survey of income and living conditions, because it's done right across the EU. In Ireland, of people under 60, 23% live in households where there's essentially no work going on. Across the EU, you might say that's down to our unemployment, across the EU the average is 10%. We're about two and a half times the average, and our 23% is the highest by a distance. We were looking that Croatia joined the EU because they are now next in line at 17%. <clears throat> and this issue of jobless households, those that essentially have zeros when it comes to the distribution of market income, forces up uh, the level of inequality that's here. And if you look at this sort of jobless households issue, it does display that the composition of the economy is quite important. When it comes to income inequality, there's a measure called at risk of poverty. How is your income compared to everybody else? And if your income is 60% below the middle, 
you're deemed to be at risk of poverty. And equally then we can sort of categorise households by these sort of working conditions. Are they a jobless household? Is there a small amount of work, a medium, a high or a very high amount of work going place in the household? If we look at that breakdown and start with high work households and work our way down to very low work households, the at risk of poverty sort of percentages in Ireland are as follows. So for very high work households, it's 1.7% of those are at risk of poverty. For high work, so high work, high work 4.2, and he's worked down through it, 7.4, 18.8, down to 46.7. So of those jobless households, 46.7% of them are at risk of poverty. If you look at the numbers for Sweden, one of the Nordic countries referred to previously, and say, well, what are their at-risk of poverty rates? Going through the same thresholds, 4.7, 12.6, 21.6, 47.4, 71.7. If you're a jobless household in Sweden, there's a 71.7% chance that you're at risk of poverty. If you're a jobless household in Ireland, it's 46.7%. If you're going to be jobless, you have a lower risk of poverty in Ireland than in Sweden. Yet if you look at their overall at-risk of poverty rates, they're higher in Ireland. For every class of working household, we have a better rate. Yet overall, they perform better than us. And it's down to composition. They only have 5% of their households that are jobless. And they have a much greater risk of poverty than in Ireland, whereas we have 23%. So when looking at these statistics, the individual composition of households uh, equally matters. David referred to the concept of low pay, and low pay is measured by the OECD. It's having an hourly wage of two-thirds of the median. And in Ireland, the hourly wage is about 18 euros per hour. So if you're below 12, you're classified as low pay. And every country does this calculation. It's two-thirds of the median in that country. So in Ireland, the threshold is 12 euro. 20% of employees in Ireland earn less than that, and they are deemed to be low pay. If you look across the EU and say, well, what are the thresholds in the other countries? In Sweden, which I just mentioned, the threshold is €9.84, 18% below Ireland. In Germany, it's 9.83, equally 18% below Ireland. In France, it's €9, Euro, below the proposed level of the minimum wage in Ireland. So what they deem to be low pay could pretty quickly be illegal in Ireland. And in UK, the threshold is €8.57, 29% below us. So while we have this low pay measure, and say, well, what's dragging it up? One thing that's dragging it up again is the presence of the multinationals. High paying sectors dragging up. So you could argue in Ireland maybe we should have all the sectors being high pay, uh, not just the, the multinational sector. But it is one issue that uh, influences the, the level of low pay in the economy. And equally, the earned income, that's the gross pay for employees, matters. What equally matters is the tax in it. If you're getting paid 12 euro an hour, well, how much are you getting to take home? Ireland has the lowest income tax rates on low pay in the EU. So if you look at those gross pay amounts, we're higher and tax lower. So an Irish worker on low pay would get to take home more of it. <coughs> so if you compare Irish low paid workers to their equally low paid workers counterparts across the EU, in Ireland, one, they get paid more. The threshold is higher. We're 12 euro compared to 980 9 euro 850 in other countries across the EU and in Ireland they're taxed less. Now you can debate whether the, the low tax benefits the workers or the companies. Do Irish companies get to pay lower wages because the tax is lower? Are they granting a certain standard of living? Or do Irish workers get a higher standard of living because the tax is lower? But that's a, a debate that will have to be worked through. <clears throat> and if we look at these measures, the amount that's paid, the tax that's taken, and then look at how do our employees fare at this at-risk of, at of poverty measure? Is working the best way out of poverty in Ireland? In fact, not only is working the best way out of poverty in Ireland, working in Ireland is one of the best ways out of poverty in the EU. The EU looks at the at-risk of poverty measure for employees. So our overall at-risk of poverty rate is about 15%. 15% of people live in households that are at risk of poverty. If you're an employee, the at-risk of poverty rate for households is 3%. And that's the second lowest in the EU. The only country with a lower at-risk of poverty rate for employees is Finland. 
So we might argue that Irish employees are low paid, etc., but they have the second lowest at risk of poverty rate in the EU. So working is good and working in Ireland can be even better. <coughs> that being said, we have these issues in terms of inequality. We do live in a divided society, but I think by and large it's one that we've created ourselves. We tend to bracket and divide people, taxpayers, unemployed, disability, carers, etc. Like one of the concepts here this week is about a republic. And one idea of republic should be treating e people equally. <coughs> I think by and large we should try to move away from this targeted system where they have a government giving goodies to everybody. Everybody gains from the government in Ireland. But we should do it equally. We shouldn't have tax credits. We shouldn't have payments to certain groups. Give whatever you're giving, give it to everybody and recoup it into the tax system. If you give me an extra 10 grand, say my income shouldn't be go, go below that, tax me 10 grand more, so I'm not better off. If somebody has an income of zero, give them 10 grand, and give it to everybody. Instead of having all these groups arriving in looking for their piece of the pie, and the government trying to treat everybody equally, just treat them equally. We're all in this together. Thanks very much.